Hello, everybody, to all the Oprah's Book Club readers and to everybody watching and listening to us on Super Soul. I'm just delighted to be here with the author of my 104th book club pick, Laura Love Harden. Her book is called The Many Lives of Mama Love. Now, <laughs> this is some title. It's a memoir of lying, stealing, writing, and healing. What a title. Well, we first met years ago. We're going to talk about this a little later. You'll see how that happened. But what I didn't know when I met you is that Laura really has had many different lives. I'll list just a few of them. Graduate student, proud of that. Soccer mom, mm -hmm. four boys, owner of a pet cemetery, a writer, a literary agent, and also a heroin addict, thief, convicted felon, and inmate number S-32179. Whoa. Well, I have to say you have had one incredible journey from being an inmate to today. And now after so many years of hiding behind the truth, the full truth, you are finally sharing your story in this uh, uh, beautiful memoir, The Many Lives of Mama Love. How does it feel in this moment to have given birth to these words, this book, and now have it out in the world, your truth? It feels like freedom. Mm. It feels um, so good not to keep secrets, mm -hmm. not to be hiding. And it feels vulnerable and scary. Mm -hmm. Scary how? I was really excited for the book to come out, but about three weeks before I had sort of this crisis, before it was publishing, and I thought, what have I done? Mm. Like all of my secrets, my interior world, my messiest version of myself is out there. And yeah, I had a lot of fear. Yeah, about what, that, that whole thing about what people are gonna think. What, what people are what gonna, are gonna think. think. Yeah. yeah, judgment. All of it. All of it. Well, I, lo I really appreciate the way you start the book, literally on page one. You say uh, reading was your first addiction, and you go on to say that the truth is you have only ever had one addiction, the white whale of addictions. Escape from as far back as I can remember, there's always been a better place than wherever I am, a better me than whoever I was. Books helped me escape when I was young. What were you escaping? I was escaping... If I had to put it in one word, I would say loneliness, mm -hmm. silence. I grew up in a family that didn't have a language for emotion. There was a lot of chaos and violence and addiction and alcoholism mm -hmm. and nobody talked about anything. And I was terrified. And would you say that what you were ultimately escaping is because this is what I found is to be one of the strongest spiritual, spiritual connections we all share is this fear of not being enough. Did you also have that? I had that fear. I mm. mean, it's, it's something I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And it was just, I didn't feel seen and I felt really like everybody else in the world was normal and different and there was something wrong with me. I think when you grow up sort of alone or mm -hmm. neglected, you internalize that and make it about you. Mm. Well, let's go to, I think when you were 24 and you graduated with a master's in fine arts in, in uh, creative writing. And this was also around the first time you tried a Percocet without a prescription, what was going on that that happened? That was only the beginning that you write. It was the beginning. I was, um, I, I graduated in, in when I was 24 and I had three boys in four and a half years. And I was in a marriage that wasn't great. And my, my dreams of this sort of happily ever family that I wanted to create for myself was, mm -hmm. were falling apart. And I, I was depressed and I had, uh, prescribed opiates. This is before the opiate crisis was a crisis and they were mm -hmm. handed out uh, nonstop. And I took a pill when I had no pain and it gave me joy. Hmm. 
it made me feel like everything was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. That was you took that one pill, and then you wanted more pills, and then more pills, and then the spiral began. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That one pill turned to two, turned to three, turned to sixty a day. Yeah, you know, I when I read that, it was just so stunning to me because I was on something for when I had knee surgery, and I was so. Uh, anxious about not becoming an addict. I would like write down every time I took the pill and I would like be in pa so much pain waiting to take the next pill, but I wouldn't take it because it said four hours. So I was, you know, gonna work my way up to the next four hours. And I was on like 10 milligrams. So when I was reading that you were taking like 60 a day, I mean, how many milligrams is that? Um, it was so tw like 300. How is that possible? I, your tolerance builds. I don't, you know, I don't know how it's possible. You got from one takes two and it just builds and builds and builds. And I tried to quit a million times. I quit them a million times because I knew this is not what I wanted to do, but I always started again uh -huh. and told myself I didn't have a problem because I could quit uh -huh. over and over again. Wow. I'm kind of floored by that because I, I felt bad going from 10 to 15. I mean, some nights I would have such fire pain that I was thinking I need at least half of another. So I cannot even imagine how the body, and you were able to function? I was able to function where people didn't know. Like you're talking normally and you're not, speech is not slurred and you're... The way opiates work in my brain, it made me, I thought, smarter and funnier and more connected yeah. and highly functioning, and nobody knew. Nobody knew, but you knew. I knew. And so there came a time, how did you move from opiates to heroin? So I stopped the opiates and I had um, six years mm -hmm. free and I remarried and my second husband, mm. and that's really what led me down a year where everything fell apart. Mm -hmm. That's when the police came. That's when the police came. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you, you, well, first of all, you tell the story so beautifully, openly, with such vulnerability in the many lives of Mama Love. So I'm asking because I know that there are many of you who are watching and who are listening who haven't read the story. I hope you will read uh, the many lives of Mama Love. But I'm wondering, when you're in that spiral, is there anything anybody could say to you that would have brought you out of it? Like you now have married someone. At first you're like, I can't believe that you're doing that. It's despicable to me. I detest this. Next thing you've tried it, now you're doing it. Now you're trying to hide it and making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. I know that there are many people who are listening and watching who are dealing with family members who are exactly where you were. Is there anything that could be said or done or what is the best thing to say or do? I don't think there was anything anyone could have said to me unless someone could have told me the future, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it would, you know, I, I wanted to stop. I had, I was desperate to stop and I couldn't. I knew the way I was living was wrong. I knew the choices I was making were going against my values. But you feel like you're in survival mode that you will die if you stop. Mm. So I think, I was afraid of judgment. So I don't know, I was never approached it from a place of love and acceptance around it. I don't know if that would have helped. If somebody had said what? So what are if the someone words? had said... I know that you're addicted. I know that your life is out of control and there's hope and we'll help you. And somehow took away all the fear of what that would mean. The irony is at the time, I didn't think I could go 30 days away from my children. Mm. I thought, how could I possibly spend 30 days mm. away from my children? So I don't have the time to go someplace and get clean. Mm -hmm. I can't stay 30 days away from your children. Instead, you ended up spending how much time away from your children? I spent 
um, close to a year incarcerated. I then had another couple months to get my youngest son back. Mm -hmm. And I never had my older boys back in the same way. Mm. In that day-to-day, do homework, make dinner, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was gone. It was gone. That's the price you paid. That's the price I paid. I had them in my life. I loved them. We spent time together. But I never, it takes so long to rebuild. I never had, by the time I had that, they were off to college. Mm -hmm. You know, I never had those moments that I took for granted. So once your addiction got so bad and you had drained your money and you started stealing from your neighbors, which... When you think about life on the California cul-de-sac and look at you in the Target store. Did you shop at Target? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And see you in, 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 in Target, it's really kind of pretty shocking. I mean, it's just like, I always say this, you never know what is going on behind closed doors in somebody's life. Where did you get the idea to start stealing from your neighbors? <sighs> I don't know where I got the idea. It's a horrible idea. I cared yeah. about these people. And when you're in that sort of desperate place to maintain the addiction, to maintain the facade, it was the most available place. Um, it felt like the easiest. And, and maybe some part of me thought it wouldn't be as much trouble. I don't know. I don't know exactly. It's, mm-hmm. you know, these are people I cared about, people who trusted me. And you're just not, it's hard to like now with logic, look back at a time when you're so illogical. Yeah, it's so interesting because you look back and you say, what was I thinking? Well, what was I thinking? Well, you weren't thinking. How could I do that? Yeah, the, you weren't thinking. The addiction was thinking for you. So tell us about what you do so well in the book. It's a, it's a stunning moment when... Uh, the police officers come to your house. Everything had been spiraling out of control. And I was in that place where I'll just, tomorrow I can fix it. Tomorrow Mm -hmm. is the day I'll fix it. And then I ran out of tomorrows. And there's pounding on the door. And my husband at the time said, hide the drugs. And, you know, I threw them in a sock drawer. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And and I remember walking down the hallway. Nobody's going to look there. Yeah. Um... I remember walking down the hallway and going down the stairs and there's sheriff's deputies looking up at me and I knew it was over and part of me was relieved. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was in front of me, but part of me felt relief. Mm. But your son Caden was there. My son Caden, who was almost four at Mm -hmm. the time, was the only one home. The others were in school, junior high and high school. And... They wouldn't let me call someone to come get him. I was under arrest. I was read my rights, as was my husband at the time, his Caden's dad. And I was begging them to call someone. They called Child Protective Services. And he ran to me for comfort. My hands were handcuffed behind my back. And I think, you know, it's 15 years ago. It's still. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that was the moment that I think broke me, you know, split me, and the, the reality of all of the bad decisions I made, all of the inability to ask for help, all of the choices I had made in that moment, seeing him terrified and pulled away and taken away by strangers was too much. Mm. There was no delusion anymore. There was no convincing myself I could fix things or everything was going to be okay. hmm And that moment, I'm sure, was defining or, or, yeah, that moment would be defining in every area of your life going forward because it determined how hard you worked to get clean or determined, you know, how you wanted to come back home. It determined a lot, that moment. And it's so interesting because, you know, the spiritual lesson is it had to be that for you. That's what it took for you. It had to be that bad for me. Yeah, that's what it took for you. Because it ended up where there was no time. There's been no moment since then where I've ever thought, "Mm, that wasn't bad enough for me. Right. And that's a gift. And I'm sorry that the, you know, learning things the hard way Mm -hmm. creates a lot of collateral damage for the people you love. 
Yes. Yes. But you don't have to learn that lesson again. No, I That's don't. That's the beauty of it. So you were charged with 32 felony counts. Bail was set for $250,000. And in a matter of minutes, you go from the lovely cul-de-sac to the county jail. And you write that jail is a class system and a study in racial segregation worthy of the South in the 1950s. There are rules I don't know, a system I can't comprehend, a hustle I have never learned, a power structure that is somewhere between an adolescent sleepover party and being jumped into a gang. I mean, that had to be the culture shock of all it, times. It was a culture shock. It was uh, a, f a foreign world. And it was also a community that ended up saving me. Hmm. But that first morning waking up, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't, I had not been in and out of jail. And so I didn't know the rules and the system. Were you afraid for yourself? Like what will happen to me in jail? I was full of fear and terror, but not from the women I was in jail with. I was mostly in terror of from my own mind mm -hmm. and the, the power structure, the guards were more, caused more fear for all the women. Really? Not everyone, but yeah. How did you cope knowing that, that this, life, this facade of a life, although it was a facade, but it was in what you were trying to do was create this picture perfect life uh, that you thought you were projecting to the world. How did you cope knowing that it had been shattered by your own choices? I didn't cope well at first. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know where my son was. Because they just took him away and didn't they tell you anything. They took him anything. away. They didn't tell me, and I imagined the worst. You know, they're taking him away to protect him from me, but in my mind, he was potentially getting harmed with That's strangers. Right. That's right. And in that moment, it was a few nights after jail, I came to the darkest moment I've ever had in my life where I just thought, I actually have failed at life. Like, it's over. I tried. Mm -hmm. I did my best. I know. I cheered up when I read that on page 49 where you said, I've decided to end my life. It feels like the best decision I've made in a long time. I mean... It felt like peace. Yeah, when I read that, I thought, that's as low as it gets when you've just decided that. And also, I, I, I can imagine also some relief in that. Did you also feel that? I felt some relief in that decision because I didn't think I had any spark of anything to get through what was in front of me. Mm. And you left a note to your children. Do you remember what you said in the note? I did. I, I do. I, I told them I was sorry. Mm -hmm. I told them I loved them. And I told them that I hoped addiction never got a hold of them. Because mm. I, I did believe in that moment, which again, when you look back from where you are now, how could I ever think that? But I thought it would be better for them to have a mother who was not alive than a mother who was in prison mm. in that moment. So what caused you to move beyond that darkest night of your soul, that darkest moment of despair? The way I think about it now, what happened that night in my darkest moment feels miraculous mm -hmm. to me. I, I fell asleep. Now, when you're detoxing from opiates, I didn't sleep again for a month, but that night with the sheet tied around my neck in six knots, waiting for everyone to fall asleep, so you could hang yourself? So I could hang myself. I ended up sleeping through the guard changes, the light shining, the noise, 
and not waking up until they pushed in the chairs for breakfast. Because you had planned a certain time when everything was quiet and then you slept through it. Yeah, and I am so grateful that, that you slept I fell through asleep. It. Yeah. I am so grateful. Yeah, that's the hand of something greater than yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You had plans, but the God force, the life force had other plans, yes. And luckily I was not in that dark a place. Um, I found out that that day that Caden was going to be able to be with his brothers and my ex-husband. The next day? Then That morning. Wow. As I'm trying to undo knots and, and embarrassed that someone might think I needed help still. Mm -hmm. um, they called me into emergency court and I found out that Caden was going to be okay. Mm. And everything was not great, you know, <laughs> the next day, but I was never in that hopeless. Because he had been sent to live with? My older boys who were with my first ex-husband. Right. And I knew as long as he was with his brothers and family, he would be okay. So he's with your ex-husband? Yeah. Yes. The and first. Brothers. I got a couple. The, the fir <laughs> yeah, the first. Yeah, the first ex-husband. Mm -hmm. You write, this was one of your big aha moments. You say, my whole life I'd pretended to be a beautiful, happy, shiny person in the hopes that that, that would somehow make me a beautiful, happy, shiny person, pretending to be. And I fit in everywhere because people love beautiful, happy, shiny people. But the problem with me trying to fit in everywhere is that I never actually felt like I belonged anywhere or with anyone. What did this aha moment mean to you? Because I was in jail and that number, everything I had constructed out of my identity was gone. And there's a lot of time to think and reflect, and I was not on drugs. And so I had... Was coming off of drugs hard in jail? Because you're arrested, you were already, were you high when you were arrested? Um, I was, yes, I'm sure I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was not pleasant physically, um, but it was really emotionally the hardest thing mentally mm -hmm. because I wasn't numbing out. You know, all the pain I had been running from my whole life, now I had, you know, quadrupled it a million times over that I had to deal with with no chemical buffer in me. Mm. And rumination and endless thoughts and trying to rewrite the past like you do. If only I had done this and not this. Um, and all of that self-reflection, you know, was the beginning of starting over with who I am from a blank slate mm. from a number. You, you, you attended church services in jail and you prayed and you wrote, I don't know how I feel about God, so I pray to the universe. I pray to find my path, my purpose, my goodness, my soul. I pray for the strength and power and bravery I've given lip service to. And I pray that whatever I need, I can find inside myself because that's all I have. That's a good prayer. It was a good prayer. So how did being in jail change or awaken you spiritually? I learned to meditate in, in jail. jail. Mm -hmm. Again, some of us learn things the hard way. There's better ways to do it, <laughs> but it is right. a great place. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to become a heroin addict no. and, mm -mm. And, and, and have the police come to your door. Definitely not. But I read um, the one book I had in the main jail was this book called The Power of Now. Mm-hmm. And I read it over and over again. And there was one thing I learned in that was this trick to think to yourself, I wonder what my next thought will be. And when you think that, there's this, there was this little brief glimmer of space between space the and, and, and beauty. And I wanted more of that. And I kept meditating and, and I would get that longer and longer for longer and longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what saved me and what started the journey. The Power of Now by mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle. I have to tell you, that book, um, which was first given to me, I think, um, uh, several decades ago, and I started to read it, and it changed a lot for me too. And I would have to say, even to this day, getting through, first of all, the, the, what he teaches about presence, 
you know, I, I live for that. I think that is the gift of life is to be fully present in any moment, as I know you do too. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was going through a huge crisis and the only way I got through it was just this moment and then the next moment and then the next moment, just focusing on this moment. Because if you start to think about all the things that might come or all of the things that, you know, could manifest from whatever crisis you're currently in, you, you can easily get overwhelmed. But if you just can stay in this moment, is that what you learned to do? I learned to say right now, right I'm now. okay. Right now, I'm right okay. Right now, I'm okay. I can't think about 37 years in prison, not seeing my children again until they're adults. Right now, I'm okay. Because what was the sentence for you? Um, it ended up being a, uh, a plea deal where I had a year in county jail, mm -hmm. which with time off ended up being 10 months for good behavior. A year in drug court is what it was supposed to be, and then five years of probation. Mm -hmm. But when they originally give the sentence out, what do they say? Originally, when I was charged, they were saying it could be 27 years in prison. Yeah. And that idea that I'm not going to see my children till they're in their 30s, I couldn't comprehend that. But I came to a place because there is so much uncertainty as you're going through court dates over and over again um, before you're sentenced, before you know, I had to just stay in the moment. And then in all those court dates... The other thing I learned from that book was send in love and light to that prosecutor who's glaring at me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to be here and be an acceptance for whatever happened, mm -hmm. was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for any mother, it's agonizing to think of being separated from your children. And you write about that moment where Caden is reaching for you and your hands are cuffed. I was moved when you wrote about you being transported to a different part of town and you feared that you couldn't breathe the same air as your sons. That was such powerful imagery. Can you describe that moment for us? I used to both think about and dream about where they were. And in my dreams, I'd always be running on the beach near where they lived. And there was something, because I was... That whole year, I missed birthdays and holidays and Mother's Day and all the things, again, that I took for granted. But there was something comforting to know that they were a few miles away. And I would imagine that we were breathing the same air, that I could send my love to them through that distance. Mm. One day, a guard gives you a copy of the local paper that shows your photo on the front page with the headline, Neighbor from Hell sentenced. There are also hundreds of negative comments posted online at the time. What happened that allowed you to break free from other people's judgments? I think being on the front page as a neighbor from hell, I mean... It took a long time. Someone had anonymously printed out all those comments and mailed them to me in jail, and I read them over and over again, and I carried them around for, for years, I mean, literally. I carried those around and I you read carried the them. negative comments. I around. carried them, you know, figuratively in my head, but literally I kept looking back and trying to figure out who who was saying these things and who was, you know, it's strangers and and there were threats and all of these horrible things that it was it was sort of the manifestation, the physical reality of the worst things you've ever thought about yourself. The right. worst things I've ever thought about myself, like I'm bad. I don't deserve good things. I'm a horrible mother. And it was this reinforcement and I, I, it took a long time before I stopped both reading those and thinking about that moment, but also, you know, became okay with what people think about me. Mm. It took way longer than I thought it would. Yeah, I understand that journey. I do. Can you, another book that you were influenced by, which is another one of my favorite books that I, I helped introduce to the world, was Mark Nepo's The mm. Book of Awakening, a book I have on every nightstand in my house. And when people come to visit, I say, you can take that book. Uh, it became your mantra in jail, right? Pain pushes you until vision pulls you, right? I loved that book. That became my mantra. I read that book like a horoscope. Because mm -hmm. they're daily lessons daily. every day. Yes. Yeah. And there was so much wisdom and solace and comfort 
in his words. So in jail, you earned the nickname Mama Love, and that came how? It came, well, every woman in jail has a nickname. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you get it, you know, either it's given to you or, you know, it's something you had out on the streets. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, my best friend in jail was only two years older than my oldest son. So I was still a mother at my core. I had all this mother energy and, and that was the nickname that was given to me. Because? Because not on drugs and in my nature, I am nurturing. I like to help. I uh, like to give comfort and you know, I was a lot older mm -hmm. also. And you earned the nickname because you, you'd help them plead their cases by writing letters to the judges in their own voices. What did those women teach you about yourself? The women I was in jail with, they were incredibly creative and intelligence and intelligent and business savvy and artists. And, and they taught me the power of community they helped me not feel alone. Hmm, I could see that. You know, there's no other community that was welcoming of me, both while I was in jail and after for a long time. But they helped me feel valuable and good again, too. Because helping them write letters as them, you know, everyone has their skills. And in right. jail, everyone's expressing their talents as a chef. Or, and mine was writing, and I was able to start writing again. And I, I stopped writing when I started using opiates. And without the opiates, I started writing again and listening to their stories and helping them write letters to the judge because that was a skill I had. So we were talking about your sentencing. So after pleading guilty to 32 felonies and facing 27 years in federal prison, you received this one-year sentence in jail. And your public defender told you that if you were not a white woman, you would have been sent to federal prison. How do you process or do you process the privilege and opportunity afforded to you? Do, you? do you believe that to be true? Because you say in the book that the hierarchy, the racism that goes on in prison is like 1950s. It, it is. Yeah. And, and I think if I hadn't been a middle class white woman, I would have gone to prison. There was a woman I was in jail. So it's class and it's race. It's class and race, both. Right. And <clears throat> so you're the, the cul-de-sac helped in this. The cul-de-sac helped. And, you know, women of color in the prison system are way overrepresented Absolutely. and more likely to be sentenced to prison and more likely to, to be, be seen arrested. As, yes. And to be perceived as guilty. Yeah. Yes. And so I would think that that would work against you. I was thinking you were going to have a much tougher time. I think it is owed to your own personal nature, your own giving, nurturing, mothering spirit that you survived as well as you did because I thought you're going to have a tough time in, 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 in jail. And, and you were essentially after a time welcomed into the community and your skills were, were useful and you learn from other people and they learn from you. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is we might have, the women I was in jail with, we might not have ever run into each other mm -hmm. outside of jail. Probably it, wouldn't, not. Have. Right, but 80% of women in jail are mothers like me. Yeah. Of minor children and we had that in common. We were all experiencing the separation from our children, mostly everyone. Yeah. I do a lot of work at the Women's uh, Correctional Institute, and exactly what you're talking about is this sense of community. And also, everybody is so really intelligent and thoughtful and um, impressive in their own way, in the way that they think about the world. So how do you look at the jail experience? I think going to jail was the best thing that ever happened to me. It made me a better mother. It uh, made me a better writer and prepared me for a career I didn't know I was going to have. It 
develop helped me develop empathy, which I think is a superpower. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gave me community. I think people will make a family wherever they are if they're together. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it saved my life. Explain why life on the outside becomes such a catch-22 for so many people. You know, having not gone in and out of jail before, I would see women I was in there with that were getting out and they were full of good intentions and I'm going to connect with my family and go back to school and not do drugs and then they would be rearrested and I didn't understand. And I thought at the time that I was going to follow the rules and pay for my crimes and then it would be done. And when you get out, I had no idea how everything is set up to send you back, everything. And I had no idea that I, there would be times that I would feel like I would be safer if I were in jail than out of jail on probation. Tell me why. Because you're walking this tightrope where at any second, because you don't have transportation, which I didn't to get to a drug test, you don't have childcare, you, you know, you have to get a job, but you have to have a job that'll hire you with a record, but also that you can leave on a moment's notice to drug test. You have to, um, there's just so many illogical obstacles that it's a setup for failure. And there's also, you know, the first thing that happened to me is someone called and said I was somewhere I wasn't when I was out of jail. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know that anyone could say anything to get you put back in jail. And it was terrifying. This, this constant fear that you could do nothing wrong, never commit a crime again, and still end up back in jail. I still have dreams. I had a dream a month ago that I have to go back to jail and it's a mistake and no one knows. You know, there's just this constant fear. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I have learned working with women who have been jailed um, that has become very clear to me and it's not just rhetoric or saying Prior to working with women uh, who were behind bars, I'd heard uh, Brian Stevenson say, you're not the worst thing that you've ever done. And coming in contact with people who have done some pretty horrible things, I can still see you're not the worst thing you've ever done, that everybody deserves redemption. When did you recognize that you deserve redemption? It took me almost a good decade post-jail to recognize that. Mm. And it was so hard, you know, and I had the joy to spend some time and work with Brian Stevenson. Mm-hmm. But I, I couldn't give myself the same compassion and non-judgment that I would give anyone else. I could say that about someone else and I couldn't say that about myself. And I think it was because I was so full of shame and it took a long time to give myself the same compassion I would give to other people. So let's talk about, speaking of Brian Stevenson, Anthony Ray Hinton. Uh, many of you may remember I chose a book for my book club, um, I think 2018. 2018. Uh, the Sun Does Shine uh, by Anthony Ray Hinton. And you were the ghostwriter on that book. And as a result, of uh, me choosing that book. I interviewed Mr. Hinton, Dr. Hinton now we call him, Mm -hmm. Uh, interviewed Dr. Hinton and we all went to lunch and you were at that lunch. You were at that lunch and we met and I read in the book that that lunch made a big impression on you. Well, I was having lunch with Oprah. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, I was I was keeping a big secret as I was working on that book and nobody knew that I was incarcerated and I was trying to do my good work quietly. And that lunch was such a full circle moment, you know, to go from jail to like... Writing a book for somebody who had helping, been in jail yeah, for to, 30 years yeah, for as an a innocent, crime he did not commit. As an innocent man. An innocent man on death row. And I was yes. so moved and honored that he trusted me with his story. I mean, the last person he thought to, like, help him tell his story was a middle-aged white woman mm-hmm. from California. 
and helping him get his, you know, rearrange the letters on the page. It was his story, but helping him tell his story. Um, in a way that it can be a book. In a way that could be a book. Yeah. And, and Which you were gifted at before you went to jail, lost that gift, mm -hmm. and then came back and reemerged yourself in, 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 into writing. Yeah. Yeah. And into my first love you know, writing mm -hmm. and writing was always how I processed the world mm -hmm. and my feelings and to, to do that again and get to, to do it in a way that felt it was making impact in the world, mm -hmm. uh, even if no one knew mm -hmm. and I was good adjacent, it helped me feel good. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, here, you know, I remember every word of our conversation because I got to sit next to you at lunch, but you were, you were talking about power and, and, getting to choose who you shine a light on. And I felt very inspired by that. And, you know, it would be a couple years before I ultimately, you know, made a career move so I could do that in my little lane, mm -hmm. in my little way. Mm -hmm. um, but we all have the power to shine our light. Mm -hmm. on whomever we choose. And, you know, even when I ended this show, one of the last things I was saying is that everybody has their own platform, as we certainly can see now through social media. Everybody has their own platform and how you choose to use that, even before social media, your platform is your circle of friends, your church, your community, your, your family, and how you choose to use the energy of your own life, the energy of, of that power, is going to be reflective of, you know, of, of your legacy, of your time here on earth, of what mm -hmm. you had to give, you know? And now look at you doing it. Mm -hmm. Look at you doing it. You know, we were talking about your taking such a long time to be able to feel that you deserved redemption. You've struggled with self-forgiveness. What do you want people who are listening to us now or watching us... Uh, to know about this process of learning to forgive yourself, who people who are struggling with something that they did, that they think are still holding on to this bad thing that they did is the worst thing of their lives. I think there's so much freedom in being honest mm -hmm. about the worst thing you've done. I mean, within reason, in a way that won't hurt. Mm -hmm. But I think when you, and I got to work with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who has a whole process for, get, mm -hmm. for forgiveness. But it and was the really, Dalai Lama, yes. Yeah, but it really is having compassion for yourself, understanding that you're human, that you make mistakes. And I think it is what you do with those mistakes and mm -hmm. how you not only learn from them, but maybe help others not make the same mistakes. I think, you know, the, I think you probably said this, but there is that message in the mess. And when you can, you know, I, I, I work with authors who have really powerful stories, memoirs, and there's always this moment where their pain and suffering is transformed into helping in some way. Yeah. And, and that feels really good. Well, that is the reason to tell your story. I believe mm -hmm. it's the reason to tell your story. What do you want? What is your... Well, first of all, the fact that I would call you for this book, the fact that this book ended up on my desk, I don't even know how that happened. I don't know how it happened because in general, I have, you know, friends who send books to me. I have an editor at O'Daly who sends books to me. And I started reading it and I realized that it was you who had uh, helped Anthony Ray Hinton write the Sandoshan. And I was saying, oh, well, uh, this is interesting. Oh, I remember, I think I went to lunch with Laura. I remember, I mean, Vegas, like one of those, because I remember the restaurant and I remember all the people at the table and then I was off to something else. But um, I started reading the book and I felt it to be so compelling that I ended up calling up the editor and I said, I think this is going to be the, the next book. And I'm sure somehow the energy of Laura put the, got this book on my desk. I don't know. How did that happen? 
I mean, I was trying to manifest it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, obviously it's a dream of every author and writer. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I wrote a lot of books as other people. Mm -hmm. And being in service that way felt good. And I did my own book. And I had this moment where I was like, am I better at being other people than being me? Ooh, good question. In December, I had that feeling. Yeah. And that's okay, but it was this, this moment where I asked that question. Because you were, you helped write the Dalai Lama and Bishop Tutu's book. I helped write, um, I helped write, you know, 13 other books for people, mm. you know, New York Times bestsellers, some of them, mm -hmm. as, you know, helping them tell their story. And, and I, this is my childhood dream, right? Before, before motherhood, before addiction, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted mm -hmm. to write books that made people feel, that helped them make sense of the world, that gave and them hope. This is the beauty of this on Super Soul, is that... All these years of your life you spent pretending and trying to escape and be someone that you were not and put up the facade. And then finally, you come to the truth of yourself and you recognize that the truth of yourself, the story that you have to tell about your one wild and not so perfect life, um, is the story that ends up enhancing the lives of other people. So what do you think is the spiritual and life lesson in this story, the many lives of Mama Love. What's the big takeaway? There's so many big takeaways for me. I think part of it is that every situation and circumstance and person has the capacity to change and transform. I think for me, from the time I was young, I wanted to be someone else and that pursuit of being who I thought anybody and everybody needed me to be led me to the opposite place. Mm -hmm. I thought it would give me love and acceptance and approval, and I thought it would be seen. And so doing this book where I am, here is all the light and the dark, the, the, the good and the bad, the ugly and the beautiful, the, the spectacular failures and the self-doubt that was me being seen. Like, here's everything. I don't have to hide anything anymore. That's when I say it's like freedom. Mm -hmm. And not everyone's going to love me or like me. Um, and my job now is to make sure that, you know, that someone who doesn't love me or like me or who doesn't believe in me or doesn't judge me isn't me, right? Ooh, it has always came down to self-love and self-compassion and love in general. And, and, when you're trying to pretend to be someone else, it is so isolating because you're not letting anyone get to know you. Mm -hmm. And you can never heal that piece of you if you're not in community. I mean, that's the greatest gift. You know, I, I can be messy and me and have not be my best self on any given day. And now I have people that I can be real with and they get me through that and I let them. And I don't worry that my feelings and emotions are burden to people. Mm. And I will ask for help all day long now. Mm. And I think what I found from readers is, who have no shared experience of going to jail or being an addict, they know shame and they know keeping secrets and they know self-doubt and self-judgment. And now people tell me all their secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think there's something about failing and not giving up. Yeah. I almost gave up once. The one thing I can teach my children is I have not given up. Mm. I had one moment. That's the only time in my life where I wanted to give up or thought that was an option. Yeah. Well, I so admire your resilience and your courage to speak your truth. Thank you. Thank Laura you. Laura Love Harden. Mom Love, thank you for sharing your journey and how you made it to the other side. The Many Lives of Mama Love is available now. 
everywhere you buy your books. And you can also download the audio version where you can hear Laura tell her own story in her own words. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent.